The goal for tonight is if I can give you a taste of what Hanukkah um, is and what it could be. It's again, it's my experience of Hanukkah. Um, it's the story I tell myself of Hanukkah. It's the way my father celebrated Hanukkah. It's the way my grandparents celebrated Hanukkah. And I've always felt that South Africa, with all its blessings, it's lost out on one great thing, and that is it's lost out on really learning how to do Hanukkah. Um, it's usually people away on holiday. Hanukkah is not a big deal. It's the kind of thing that you do by the way. And what I want to show you tonight is whether you're in town or you're away over Hanukkah, it's a big deal. It's actually a very, very big deal. And to the, together, we're going to experience this big deal. We're going to experience a donut. My wife was kind enough to make donuts just for show and tell tonight. Um, we're going to experience a beautiful mineral lighting. Let me just turn on my uh, other video. And I will now spotlight. As you can see, I set up, um, second, I need to find it over here. Yeah, right over there, you'll see a menorah that I set up by the doorway slash window. It's a bit of a far distance of yet, but the goal is I will walk over and we'll actually explore the menorah together and see that picture. We're gonna watch a video, quick video about how to make donuts. We're going to play dreidel. We're going to do this version of the Hanukkah, which is maybe a little more familiar for you. We're gonna do this version of the Hanukkah with olive oil, which might be a little less familiar, but a, a beautiful custom. And we will, we will share the Hanukkah story and many other things. So that's really what we're gonna be doing tonight with our two cameras. We're going to be exploring the Hanukkah story in a original way. Let's me all set this down and yeah, we could focus over here on the donuts. For those who wanna look at the second screen, they could see the donuts. Okay. <laughs> now let's get a bit of perspective of what Hanukkah is, when did it happen? I often find, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, that we know so much, but we often lack context. When did it happen? So Hanukkah happens not too long before the Common Era. Right now we're in the year 2020, about to go into the year 2021. And Hanukkah happens the year 169 BCE is when things start really going bad and um, it continues into 168. Remember before Common Era, before you start counting two thousand um, from year one, you're counting backwards. So like year 200 BC is older, it's longer away than 100 BC. So 168 BC is when Hanukkah um, is, is happening a lot. And 167 BC, it's that time of the um, that time of history. It's about 240 years before the destruction of the temple. The second temple would be destroyed in the year 70 common era. And this is 169, 68, 67 BCE before common era. At that time, the Jewish people, not all of them, but many of them were living in the Holy Land of Israel. And there was a temple standing in Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This was the final temple that we would have. We had the first temple built by King Solomon. This was built many years later by Ezra. And it was a magnificent space. At some stage, the Greeks become very, very powerful. It's during the second temple era that we really find um, the rise of Greece. And Greece was a, a powerful, powerful um, kingdom. Alexander plays a huge role. He is Mr. Greece, although he was a Macedonian. He plays a huge role. And in the spring of 318 BCE, that's, uh, that's a, a 
about 150 years before the Hanukkah story, um, Alexander sets forth from Egypt to pursue um, the King Darius. He starts conquering various little places and eventually he becomes super, super powerful. And Alexander dies at a relatively um, young age. And when Alexander dies, his kingdom is divided amongst many different rulerships, specifically three rulerships. And one rulership was in the north, what's today Syria, Lebanon. The other one was in the south, Egypt. And Israel was caught in between. Israel was always caught between the two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And over the next 150 years, the Greeks are fighting to conquer the, um, that little area. The two Greek empires, the one in the north, that's Syria, Asia Minor, Babylonia, and the southern one, which is based in Egypt, they're fighting constantly to conquer. And when the Hanukkah story takes place in the year 168 BCE, at that stage, the Jewish people are being ruled by the northern, so they're called the Syrian Greeks because literally, they, although they were not really Greeks, they were the Greek culture based in Syria. And the Jewish people were being extremely um, attracted to the Greek way of life. I've said it before that it's something about the Jewish people, whenever we see a nice sophisticated culture, we fall hook, line and sinker. And we buy into it, oh my gosh, the best thing ever. When it's a primitive culture, like when we're living in Poland or Lithuania, we don't necessarily engage and assimilate. But when we live in places like Germany and uh, England, the West, that's when we, we assimilate. And this was a, a massive assimilation that took place with the Jewish people. Now, there was a king. His name was Antiochus. He had a name that they called him to flatter him, and they, called, they had a name behind his back. The name to flatter him was called Antiochus Epiphanes, which means the illustrious. Behind his back, they called him Epimenes, which means the madman, because he was an absolutely mad individual. He thought he's divine. He ordered statues of him erected everywhere. He was an absolute um, in every in, in the... In the the the, yeah, the, in every stretch of the word. And temples uh, uh, to honor him. He spent lavishly on grandiose public entertainments. He behaved like a fool, even dancing naked with his royal entertainers. Meshugana. And he wanted attention. He was like a real populist. He wanted the attention. And he was trying to bring the Greek ideology, specifically Hellenism, which is very secular and, you know, body focused into the Jewish community. And he did he, with very mixed success. He had some Jews that supported whatever he did, but a big part of the Jewish community um, was still standing strong. And the Hellenists within the Jewish community became more and more dedicated to destroy Judaism from within. Unfortunately, that's something we find throughout history that very often it's the Jewish people who know how to destroy themselves um, and self-destruct even better than our enemies, unfortunately. And they take the function away um, even from being the high priest. The Kohen Gadol was no longer a pious individual. It was a Hellenist who took over the role of Kohen Gadol as appointed by king. And the gymnasium became not only a place of athletics, it became a place of idol worship and immorality. Exercises were performed naked before games were held. Sacrifices were offered to Her Her Hercules, the, the gods of the Greeks. Now, more and more, the, the community was getting radicalized in Hellenism, the Jewish community and the, the Greek community. And the next, but even this wasn't good enough. The, the, the standard of decay wasn't good enough for the, for, the, for the Jewish Hellenists. So 
the next guy bribed himself into becoming the high priest. His name was Menelos, uh, Menelos, and he managed to bribe his position, and he began to ruthlessly oppress the people, persecute Jewish religion, and he had a brother. They took the golden vessels of the Holy Temple, sold them to raise money to pay the royal tribute, et cetera, et cetera. And things were and it becoming more corrupt and more corrupt. Alarmed by the term of events, the people of Jerusalem began to express this dissatisfaction. What these guys did is they, fearing an organized revolt, they fell upon the people with an armed band of 3,000 soldiers. And the, the brother of the Kohen Gadol, the brother of the Hellenist leader, was killed. The Sanhedrin, the great Jewish sages, sent a message to the king that things were really guilty and how much corruption it was, and the king didn't buy it. So the Kohen Gadol, the Melanos, stayed in this position and became even more, more cruel. And as things are developing, it's a fascinating, heartbreaking story. Um, things start getting really, really hectic, and Antiochus becomes more brazen. He enters the temple, he steals gold and silver. He removes the golden altar, he removes the menorah, he removes the table, he removes the curtain in front of the um, Holy of Holies. Um, Antiochus then sends, the king sends 22,000 soldiers. They go, into the, uh, they go into the city, they attack the people, they massacre many, many Jews. They destroy the houses and walls guarding the city. Women and children are taken captive and the directives are getting more harsh and more harsh. You're not allowed to keep Shabbos. You're not allowed to keep festivals. You're not allowed to keep Rosh Chodesh. You're not allowed to keep kosher. You're not allowed to circumcise. You're not allowed to go to the mitvah. Um, you're not allowed to use God's name. All copies of Torah had to be confiscated and burned. It's getting really, really, really aggressive. And unfortunately, the Jewish lackeys, the Jewish uh, you know, turncoats were enforcing it with brutality. And on the 15th of Kislev, which is actually yesterday on the Hebrew calendar, in the year 168 BCE, an idol was erected on the altar in the temple. And beginning with the 25th of that month, which is the first day of Hanukkah, but a few years later, a while later, pigs were offered on the altar to a pagan deity. Now, many Jews were had incredible acts of courage during this time. One of the famous stories is the story of Hannah and her seven sons. Hannah and her seven sons were captured and the king wanted to force them to partake in pig's meat. When they refused, even after being tortured, Antiochus put them um, to a slow and barbarously killed them painfully. But these seven noble brothers defied the cruel king to the last and declared their faith in God. And Hannah was standing there encouraging her sons to sanctify the name. Even when her youngest son, a little boy, they said, just eat the meat. No. And she watches how all seven of her sons are killed. And then the distraught mother climbs on the roof and jumps to her death. And a heavenly voice proclaims the verse, the mother of the children is joyous. In other words, this is the ultimate piety. And ever since then, Hannah was an incredible inspiration. Um, obviously, it's a terrible story, but inspiration of what it means, commitment. Um, it was getting worse and worse and worse. At that stage, there was a guy named Matasio, the Hashmonai, from the family of Hashmonais. And he was the son of Yohanan, the, the previous Kohen Gadol, who was still a pious Kohen Gadol, not the, one of these Hellenists. And they left Jerusalem where the persecution was worse, and they settled in Modi'in, the city till today, Modi'in. It's not exactly where it was, but in the same area, not too far off Jerusalem, a Judean village, and about eight and a half or to 11 miles away from Jerusalem. The terror follows them to the small town. One day, the king's forces appear and demand that the townspeople offer a sacrifice to a pagan god. They attempt to convince the aged Matisyao that it would be to his advantage if he sets an example to the people. Were he to comply, he and his sons would be considered the king's friends, an official title carried with many privileges. 
Matisseau proudly and publicly declares his determination not to do so. As he was declaring his defiance, a renegade Jew neared the altar to offer the sacrifice. When Matisseau saw this, he was filled with rage at this desertion of Torah. He grabbed the sword and killed not only the Jewish renegade, but the Syrian emissaries by the king. And that's actually how the Hanukkah revolt began that moment. Matisseau saw the desecration being perpetrated upon Judea and Jerusalem, and he screams out, woe is to me, me la Hashem Eli, who is to God, come with me. Life is not worth like this. We cannot be slaves. Our women cannot be maidservants. We have to stand up for ourselves. And Matisseau and his sons ripped their garments. They put on sackcloth as a sign of mourning. And he made a proclamation, whoever is zealous for Torah, Come join him. And he and his sons left all their possessions in Modi'in and fled to the mountains in the Judean desert. Many loyal Jews followed them. The king's forces couldn't, you know, ignore what's going on, and they began to seek out the band of loyal Jews. But Matisio pushed the Jews to fight against the Syrian Greeks strongly, and with bravery, they would do things like guerrilla warfare. They would strike back at nighttime raids and demolish the altars put up for the pagans. And the revolt was getting really, really hectic. Matisseau did not live to see the result of the events they set in motion. He died the following year, 165 BCE. And before his death, he gathered his five sons, Shimon, Yehuda, the famous one, Judah the Maccabee, Elazar, Yohanan, and Yonatan, and he urged them to continue the fight. He says, follow the advice of Shimon, because he's wise, but Yehuda will be the leader. Yehuda was now the recognized leader. And he came up with the, the battle cry, the Maccabi. What does Maccabi actually mean? It, it's not Maccabi. It's um, some, like some sporting event in Israel, although it's cute. It's actually ironic because... The, at that time, the Maccabees were anti-Greek ideology, which was very sporty. Not that it's anything wrong with sports, but it's just ironic that Maccabi has come to define sport, which is actually one of the things that the Maccabees were standing up against the whole Hellenist culture. Maccabee stands, it's Mem, Kaf, Bet, Yud, and it stands for five words. Mi, Kamocha, Ba'elim, Hashem. We say it in Davening of Day. Who is like you amongst the heavenly powers, Hashem? And this was to remind them that God would do incredible miracles. Wars take on one after another after another. First, it's Philip who's appointed by the Greeks to wage the war. Yehuda's fighters were few and poorly trained, but God was with them, and they defeated army after army after army. They would fast before battle because they wanted Hashem's help. So you understand, not only were they unsophisticated in battle, untrained, they were fasting as well. And Yehuda would always tell them, don't worry, Hashem is on our side. Hashem is on our side. And he managed to kill hundreds, if not thousands of soldiers. Various battles take place. Again, you could, all, you could read much of the, the history of the Second time, the Temple era and the Greeks in Israel. You could find it online. You could reach out to me. I'll send you links. It's absolutely fascinating. Details of the military, 60,000 60, infantry, 5,000 cavalry, and Yehuda meets them with, again, uh, that was the Greek side. Yehuda has 10,000 loyal Jews, and he wins that war. And the Hanukkah story takes place, the exact year is 165 BCE. So this year is 2021 plus 165, okay, I'm not going to make a fool out of myself, but it's 2186 years ago. In other words, it's just under 2200 years ago that the Hanukkah story took place. And the 25th of Kislev, three years to the day after the terrible moment that the invaders had sacrificed a pagan abomination, on a pig on the altar, Han the Hashmanais rededicated the temple. But they were full of pain. They had found a vessel of only of undefied oil. Basically, they wanted oil that was pure, 
and undefiled by the Greeks. And they, it only lasted for one day, and it would take seven days to prepare new olive oil that was valid for kindling the menorah. It was done in quite a distance, a four-day journey. And the, they poured the oil in, and it lasted for eight days. And that gave people incredible, incredible hope. And slowly but surely, they started rebuilding the Jewish community, and the Jewish community would eventually last within Jerusalem and within Israel for another 200 plus years. And then unfortunately, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. That's the short version of the story, just to get perspective when, how, where. Now, there's two mega events that we celebrate on Hanukkah. We celebrate number one, the miracle of the oil. Oily oil, lots of oil. Then there is the celebration of the fact that we won the war. And that is, we celebrate by just, you know, saying Hallel, um, showing our gratitude, being joyous and saying various prayers. So what I'm going to do with you now is I'm actually gonna go off this screen and I'm gonna move on to the other screen. So just give me a moment. Okay, here, here we go. And what I'm gonna do is we're going to start exploring the various elements of Hanukkah in a practical and hopefully meaningful fashion. So here we go. First thing I want to show you are donuts. Why? We just had an interesting heavy history lesson. And I think it's important that you actually um, get to see how to make donuts. So I'm going to show you a quick video of how to make donuts. It's very quick. And then I'm actually going to read out my darling wife's recipe. And as a guy, expect me to make mistakes. But you could write down the notes as I do it. Or you could reach out to Chaya at any stage and she'll share with you um, how to do it. She, thank God, made some beautiful donuts here today. And here we go. Okay, so what did I just show you? Um, what I showed you is, and I'm actually gonna read it out. Um, and no, we don't put brandy in, in our um, donuts. But basically it's a very basic recipe of one sachet of yeast, one cup of warm water, three tablespoons sugar, one and a half tablespoons oil, one egg, three cups flour, mix it all together let it rise for an hour and then you know take the dough put it on a table as you saw in the video flatten it to the, about to the thickness of an inch and then take a cup and the cup will make those circle cutouts and just put them in the frying pan and let them fry and um, flip them over and then put some jam put some sugar this is a confectionery sugar it's a relatively simple Thing. And again, there's different customs. Right over here, we have donuts, but you might very well have latkes or any other. You could have chips. It's, it's, it, customs have developed over the last few hundred years. Um, donuts in Hebrew, it's called sufganiyot, and latkes, which in Hebrew are called levivot. But those are just like secondary and not the main focus of the Chag. What's the main focus of the Chag? What's the main mitzvah of the Chag? The main mitzvah of the Chag is 
the, the menorah. Now, many of you might have this menorah and let me for, just say it's great. However, if you've been lighting this kind of menorah for, for years, I would recommend you to upgrade, either to upgrade to um, real wax candles or better yet, to oil. And what I'm gonna do now is actually, um, I'm gonna light an oil menorah for you because I think more, most people get very you know, nervous when you sit there saying lighting with oil. It sounds really hectic, but it's actually a magnificent mitzvah. And it's actually the mitzvah of Hanukkah because it was lit with oil. So first, let me introduce you to this menorah, which I got from Chaya's grandmother and grandfather as a gift. It's pure silver. Um, and each year we light it. It's just a beautiful family tradition. In general, I've, I have a big passion of when we do a mitzvah, not just to do it, but to do it with beauty and that the nicest things in the home should be the mitzvah. So here we have relatively close to the floor. There's different customs. Our floor, other people would do it next to a window, um, on a windowsill. We do it by a door across the side of the mezuzah. So the mezuzah is on this side, on the other side of the doorway, so that we're surrounded by mitzvot, one side mezuzah, one side menorah, we light the menorah. Now, it's primitive, but it's, it's, it's very cute, this idea that you have a wick, you have it in a cup, and the reason I'm showing this for you is not only if you're doing it with oil, but even when you do with candles to show how we would do the first day, the second day, etc. So on the first day, we're only going to light one. And that is going to be on the extreme right. Okay. Now, what happens the second day? Second day, I add another candle. I'm going to first fill up the oil on the right and then on the left. And when I'm going to light, however, I'm going to light from left to right. So I'm always going to light the new candle first. So whether I'm doing it with oil or with candle, the new one will go first. So when it comes to filling it up or putting in the candle, I'll put the old one in first. I'll put right to left. But when I light, I'm gonna do left to right. So let's just fill up a little bit. I'm not sure if I'm gonna actually use this oil for Hanukkah. It's still a while away. And what I would do is light. I, there's various customs, but for the middle candle, which is not one of the eight, but it's the candle with which you light, custom is to use real beeswax. And on the first day of Hanukkah, we would make a bracha. And the bracha would go like this. I'm actually going to sing it in the tune that we say um, the Hanukkah story. But... One moment, I'm actually going to try to do this right, and I'm going to get a match. Let's do this well. Don't look on the school bags. Um, here we go. Just lighting the candle and you're not allowed to have any benefit from the can from the the eight lights of the menorah. So that's why you light this shamish, which you can have some benefit of. So I would hold the candle, and we'll make the bracha. I'll just say it without Hashem's name. On the first night of Hanukkah, we're going to say three blessings, and on the other nights of Hanukkah, we're only going to say two blessings, because the first night you say the Shechianu, which you always do at the beginning of a Chag, 
but not after you made it once. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu melech ha'elam Asher kitshanu b'mitzvaisav Vitzivanu lehadlikner shel That's blessing number one. That is, blessed you, Hashem, King of the Universe, who commanded me to light the candle of Hanukkah. The next one is a gratitude for miracles. Baruch atah Hashem. Elokeinu melech ha'olam She'asa nisim lavoteinu Bayamim ha'heim Bizman hazeh On night number two, that would be enough. I would then go light the second candle and then the first, left to right. On the first night, however, I'm still going to say one more blessing. Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech ha'olam, Shehechiyanu v'kimanu, V'higiyanu l'azman ha'azeh. Okay, again, first night, I would just light this. Second night. I'm going to stay at the wick until it's fully lit, standing on its own, and then I'm going to move on to the next one. And then put this down. Now, as we sit and look at these Hanukkah lights, there's an ancient tradition to actually look at this light. So I'm going to tell you some interesting um, nuggets. Sorry. Some interesting nuggets on the Hanukkah story. For example, do you know that the song Maos Tzur was only invented in the 12th or 13th century? We're not actually sure who the, who the person who wrote that song, who authored it. But the tune that you know, the tune that we all sing, Maos Tzur, there's a very strong suspicion, and more than a suspicion, that actually comes from Protestant Christian sources. And somehow it made it into the Jewish community. If you actually listen to the tune, it sounds like uh, church bells or something like that. Like, listen to the tune. It doesn't have, there's very few Jewish songs. There's no Jewish song that I know that remotely sounds similar in its notes and it's um, the way it works to that song. And there's always been people trying to, you know, invent new tunes that people should sing that it shouldn't sound like a church song. But the fact is Jewish communities have been singing this song for hundreds of years. And it's beautiful. It's a nice melody. It talks about God's strength. It talks about Hashem save us from difficult times. There's a strong um, reason to believe that it was composed during the times of the Crusaders um, when the Crusaders were going through France and Germany and destroying Jewish communities on the way to, their to the Holy Land. So it was composed at that time as a prayer, Nekom Nikmat Dama Vadecha Hashem, take a vengeance for the blood of your servants that have been destroyed, according to some opinions. The author of this actual poem um, was killed um, for being a Jew, was massacred for being a Jew. That is the, the, probably the most famous song that people sing on Hanukkah. There's another song that goes, Hanero Talalu, which is actually in the Siddur. The, and it's part of the prayer. After we say the blessings and we light the candles, we say, Hanero Talalu Kodesh Shem. These candles are holy and beautiful. We have no permission to use them. Only to look at them. The custom is to sit at the menorah for half an hour and stare at the candles, and, or if not stare at the candles, just play dreidel, do something around the candle to give it dignity rather than just light the candles and move away. You're supposed to show that they're precious to you and therefore we sit with them. Now, the, preferably the candles are supposed to be lit before nightfall, after sunset, before nightfall, 
So basically after the time that we would light Shabbos candles, about 6.45 here in Johannesburg, um, but it has to burn at least a half an hour into the night, post nightfall, a half an hour. And that's why the candles are, are not the best level of lighting manure because they never last even a half an hour, especially after the first night when there's like eight candles burning together, they don't last. They could all be burnt up within 15 minutes. So though we do the mitzvah, it's not the optimal way to do the mitzvah. And therefore, either we do it with larger candles or we do it with, um, or we do it with the oil as we advised. Now, I'm gonna move on. And we're now gonna come back and I'm going to move toward back to the other screen. So just give me a moment. Okay. And that we have to take off the sound of this, otherwise it's gonna sound absolutely terrible. I'm hearing myself double. Okay. Now, here we go. So a donut. Custom is at least one night of Hanukkah, if possible to eat a donut, make a bracha, baruch atah inai, aleheinu melech elam, barei minei zainais. Mm. Heaven on earth is first one on meaning. And the other night of Hanukkah, you're going to have a latke, which is just potatoes fried in oil. Potatoes fried in olive oil is bearable. This fried in olive oil, that's a real oxymoron. If you're eating a donut in olive oil, nah, just forget the dietitian, eat the donut. Israel is obsessed with this. When I spent a year in Israel, we did outreach. Um, it's like you show up to army bases. I remember we, this was in 2005, a few months before Israel evacuated Gaza, the Gush Katif Jewish community. Um, and we went and did outreach. It's like Hanukkah is the ultimate Chabad holiday. <laughs> Every Chabad kid from the youngest age is going to the craziest places to light menorah. But this was definitely the craziest I've ever done. And we went to Hebron, to the city of Hebron, where the patriarchs and matriarchs are buried. And there's a huge army presence there. And our job was to go to various bases and bring joy. Now, some of these bases, just to understand, they're so deep into enemy territory that the only way to get there is in a bulletproof van with a, mil a military truck in the front and a military truck in the back during curfew. We came to a base that the guys never leave for six months. They're in lockdown because they, they don't want the guys to go back and forth because they're in a very dangerous area. We shut up over there. Um, one time we actually went into a home was a Palestinian home, which they evacuated just for a few days so that the soldiers can be there and watch over the area. We went into the home, like the, on the street where a bunch of kids about to throw stones at us. It was a surreal experience. And in this base that we went to, that's very rarely accessible. I remember we there was this one soldier that was so excited for Hanukkah and he, he was he took a spoon and was banging it on a pot with all excitement until the pot actually got a dent inside. That's how hectic it was. But the point is that Hanukkah is a, is a powerful time for joy. But let me just share with you a few more customs as we explore. A dreidel. What is the story of the dreidel? Dreidels come in different sizes. But fundamentally, what's the story of the dreidel? The dreidel is a memory and the, of the commitment of the Jewish kids to Judaism. Remember, I said earlier that the Greeks made it illegal to study Torah, and they burnt all scrolls that they found. So what the Jewish kids do when they wanted to learn? They would go to the hills of Jerusalem outside the city and hide in caves and study. And when, when they would hear Greek soldiers coming close, 
what they did is they would roll up the scrolls, put it in some hiding place in the cave, and start playing with harps. Harps, like basically a, a, something similar to a dreidel, made out of wood or whatever, made out of stone, and they would just twist it, um, turn it, and that became the Hanukkah um, image, the turning dreidel. What the sages did is they added letters to it. So if you look, you'll see there's nun, sorry, nun, that's the first letter, which stands for the word nes, miracle, gimel, gadol, big, big miracle, hey, haya, was, sham, there. Nes gadol, haya, sham, a big miracle happened there. In Israel, it would start the same, it would say nun, gimel, hey, but then instead of sham, it would say pei, it would have the letter pe, because nes gadol haya po, a big miracle happened here, because the miracle happened in Israel. So if you actually go and see a dreidel in Israel, it looks different than a dreidel in diaspora, because it has a different letter. And there's the basic game of dreidel. It's a game that's been traditionally played for Jewish communities for centuries. And the game goes as follows, in case you want to play it with your family. Each family, you take a bunch of coins, or you take a bunch of chocolate coins, or you take whatever you want, and you divide it. And each, let's say you have three, four players, each player will take, I don't know, play with donuts, three donuts. Now, everyone puts one into the middle pot. And then the first guy twists. If it lands on nun, nun stands for nothing and nothing happens. If it lands on the gimel, then the person takes everything that's in the pot. If it lands on the hay, they take half of what's the pot, hay for half. And if it lands on shin, they have to put money into, they have to put one thing into the circle. And each time it empties out, everybody has to put, so for example, if one guy gets a gimel, and takes everything so all the other players will put one in. So you're constantly um, replenishing the, the middle place and eventually the person who walks out with the most wins. And if you play with chocolates, they pretty much get to eat all the chocolates. Again, these are games and these are stories that go back hundreds of years. Your grandparents, great grandparents when sitting, Hanukkah is the winter in Russia, in Lithuania. So when your grandparents were sitting in Lithuania on a cold winter night, and Hanuk and remember, in the winter, the nights start very early. So it could be sunset by 4.30, 4 5 o'clock. And 5 o'clock, you know, grandpa would come home and light the menorah. And in this dark, absolute dark, you know, barely any electricity, if they light the menorah, then the family sits around, shares Hanukkah stories, shares the history of it, sings songs. Ma osur yeshuati or whatever song they sing. There's a lot of beautiful Yiddish songs. You might recognize this if you, you had any grandparents that spoke Yiddish. Geschwinder, de Hanneke licht soll men und sinden. Sogt alanis im dein Gott, fadinis im Lommer alle tanzen zusammen. Sogt alanis im dein Gott, fadinis im Lommer alle tanzen zusammen. Basically, it's all about let's sing together. It's there's so many, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful traditional. Um, songs and, and melodies. There's incredible stories how during the Holocaust in Auschwitz and various camps, people made an incredible effort to just find a potato, cut the potato in half, make a little hole in it, fill it with some fat, take a piece of their undershirt, of their whatever clothing they had, and light a candle, light a wick. Because Hanukkah always has resembled the, the strength of the Maccabees, the strength and the resilience to defy all odds. And this year, more than ever, I'm talking to you in 2020, after a year of COVID, this year, more than ever, 
we need the Hanukkah message. We need this idea of resilience, this idea of the power of small candles. So yes, we're living here in the Southern Hemisphere and it's summertime. You don't necessarily have early nights and the candles, you know, you, you could only light it uh, at 7.30 if you really want to appreciate it, it uh, illuminating the darkness. And we have electricity and we're not freezing it. There's no snow outside. It's a very different than many other places. Like in, in, in America, it's very much the anti-Xmas uh, holiday where the Jewish kids develop a pride because they have Hanukkah and they get presents for eight days. Um, over here, it's not like that. The culture hasn't really developed. And yet, I strongly encourage you to somehow, to, in, to some way, find the Hanukkah story within your heart, to find the incredible gift of Hanukkah and bring it into your family. Your kids need Hanukkah. Your grandchildren need Hanukkah. Have a Hanukkah history. Um, have a Hanukkah party. If you can't do it face to face this year, do it on Zoom. But it's such an easy chag. It doesn't demand much. It's just a candle and some food. But it's so rich. Buy your kids gifts. Give them Hanukkah guilt. There's an ancient tradition to give kids money. It's something that we actually take very seriously. You give kids Hanukkah guilt. You teach them to spend it on charity, to spend it on buying educational books, to save, to learn saving. It's a good, it, Hanukkah guilt is a tradition. Each year, my mother will send me Hanukkah guilt. We'll get from my in-laws. We'll get from Chaya's grandparents. It's, it's a time that you give gifts. Um, money, actually, more than gifts. But whatever you do, I just encourage you this year, now that you know maybe a little more about Hanukkah than you knew before, to bring the Hanukkah into your life and to allow Hanukkah to transform you the way it should because it is such magnificent, a magnificent, magnificent day. And now I, I wanna finish off with a beautiful video